Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History World Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and today we are going to look at how Robert E. Lee replaced some of his generals. I will try to explain, to the best of my ability, why Lee performed some of his actions and understand his mindset toward these changes. William Dorsey Pender, a division commander within A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps, would be mortally wounded at Gettysburg and die on July 18, 1863. He had been a rising star within the Army of Northern Virginia and a favorite of A.P. Hill's. The death of a North Carolinian left a hole in the 3rd Corps. Someone needed to take command of his division, but whoever took that position would most likely leave a vacancy as well. So when one commander went down with a wound or was killed, it created a chain reaction through the whole army. Cadmus Wilcox, a Brigadier General in Richard Anderson's division of Hill's Corps, would take Pender's place. Wilcox attended West Point and would return to the academy as an instructor while Robert E. Lee was superintendent. Historians have characterized Wilcox as not overly intelligent, but a dependable commander, although his actions on the third day at Gettysburg have come under scrutiny. The following passage is a communication from Lee to Confederate President Jefferson Davis related to the filling of positions left in the wake of Pender's death. August 1, 1863. His Excellency Jefferson Davis. Mr. President, I have the honor to recommend Brigadier General C.M. Wilcox to the command of the division lately under General Pender. This division is composed of two brigades from North Carolina under Generals Lane and Scales, one from South Carolina, General McGowan's, and one from Georgia, General Thomas. General Lane, the senior brigadier of the division, is not recommended for promotion. General Thomas, the next in rank, a highly meritorious officer, if promoted, it is thought might create dissatisfaction. General Wilcox is one of the oldest brigadiers in the service and a highly capable officer, has served from the commencement of the war and deserves promotion. Being an officer of the regular army, he is properly assigned anywhere. I think it probable that some meritorious officers who have been on duty in General Johnston's department may be without a command. If General Stephen D. Lee is in this situation, I would recommend that he be ordered to this army to take charge of Wilcox's brigade in case of the latter's promotion. Colonel Florney of this brigade is represented as an excellent officer and worthy of promotion, but he is now absent, badly wounded, and it is said will not be fit for duty in six months. But for that, I should recommend him for promotion. Should General S.D. Lee not be available, Colonel James Deschler of Alabama, a graduate of the military academy and I believe a good officer, might be obtained. I am with great respect your obedient servant, R.E. Lee. Within this passage, there are a few topics of interest. Many times division or brigade commanders would be chosen from within the division or brigade, usually to the senior officer in the respective unit. But these guidelines were not set in stone, and we see across division, brigade, corps, and army promotions. Wilcox had served in the Mexican-American War, and as Lee stated, he was one of the older brigadiers, and he felt he deserved the promotion. It can be assumed, and rightfully so, that Lee chose the men he knew the best. The role of superintendent and instructor at West Point undoubtedly brought the two men close together. Lee was also very blunt. With Wilcox being promoted, that left Wilcox's brigade without a commander. Temporarily, it went to John C. C. Sanders, but Lee needed a permanent replacement, and I think his list of possible candidates is telling. He mentions Forney, who would come from Wilcox's former brigade, but had been wounded and captured at Gettysburg. He makes two other suggestions. One is Stephen D. Lee, and the other is James Deschler. Both men were captured by Union forces, Lee at Vicksburg and Deschler at Arkansas Post, but both would be available for service by the time Lee asked for them. What Robert E. Lee did not know was that on August 3rd, two days after he sent this letter, Stephen would be promoted to Major General, too high of a rank for brigade command. One reason that these two men are interesting is that they were in the same class at West Point, along with Jeb Stewart, William Dorsey Pender, and Robert E. Lee's own son, George Washington Custis Lee. It is well known that Robert E. Lee, as superintendent, paid close attention to that class of young men, acting as a father figure to Stewart, and inviting him and others to dinner at his house to get to know the cadets better. In this way, Robert E. Lee was a great army commander, because he had interactions with these men previously, he knew their temperament and their capabilities. He could ask for these officers by name and know them personally. 
Ultimately, neither Stephen D. Lee nor James Deschler would take Wilcox's place. Stephen D. Lee would go on to command cavalry and then an entire corps in the Army of Tennessee, and Deschler would be given brigade command in Patrick Kleber's division and be killed at the Battle of Chickamauga just a month later. Abner Perrin acted as a temporary commander of Maxie Gregg's old brigade at Gettysburg. The actual commander of the South Carolinians was Samuel McGowan, but at Gettysburg, and for a little time after that, he was recovering from injuries he sustained at Chancellorsville. When McGowan returned, Perrin had attained the rank of Brigadier General and needed a brigade to command. Lee would give him command of Wilcox's Alabamians. I hope this video helps you understand the destruction and confusion that a battle did to an army. When one officer went down, this created a domino effect of various commanders getting promoted or transferred, and this could also lead to animosity felt for having chosen one over the other. Robert E. Lee did an excellent job of choosing commanders who he felt he could trust and that others would respect in their role. No decision was going to be unanimous, but he did have a knack for finding the right man for the job in many instances. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. If history will travel, reads the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian